Good morning, everyone. I'm Francesca Maxime. This is Wise Girl, October 4th, uh, 2017. No filter today. Another no makeup day. Um, wanted to just check in with you guys and uh, talk a little bit about something that seems to be coming up a lot these days, which is addiction. And addiction not only to uh, things like alcohol or food or drugs or gambling, bad habits, you know, sex, but addiction to suffering. Addiction to seeing the world in a way that <clears throat> really, one would say, doesn't make one happy, and yet there's a certain familiarity with that kind of view or belief system that has been cultivated unconsciously over time that then makes one kind of say, hmm, you know, this is who I am. I am this person who's always worried about these things or neurotic about this or anxious about that or whatever, as opposed to opening up and widening the possibility that maybe I don't actually need to be the person who is um, only in one mode which would be the mode of being slave to the inner critic. So <clears throat> what I'm trying to get at here is that all of us have parts, right? We are, as I've said before, kind of living on two planes. One is the core of who we really are, which is love and compassionate connection and really this um, sort of more altruistic community-based uh, sense of ourselves. When we come out of the womb, we're very dependent on our caregivers, primarily usually our mom, very much uh, it could also be a grandparent or an aunt or a dad or whomever, but whoever it is that's really taking care of us. And our degree of internal security is really dependent on whether or not those early caregivers are attuning to whatever our particular needs are. And it could be the basics like food, clothing, and shelter, uh, temperature, being swaddled, being held, being uh, given an opportunity to sort of be independent and look away and then sort of come back into the room and eye gaze deeply with mommy or daddy or whomever and really make that connection because we are interpersonal beings. We co-regulate our nervous system with other people and we learn how to be self-sufficiently regulated within our own bodies uh, interoceptively when we are laid down with this nice neural network of getting attunement and proper uh, sort of needs met when we're young. And oftentimes, you know, caregivers don't necessarily do a bang up job of getting it right the first time, but what uh, will help us when we're little is when we have caregivers who are aware enough that they recognize when there's a misattunement, when there's a rupture, when there's a break in how the baby and the parent or caregiver is responding to whatever the baby's needs are. And, you know, you pick up cues. And those cues that the caregiver does or doesn't pick up are often, uh, well, they're always legitimate, but they're often perceived through the lens, they're necessarily perceived through the lens of the caregiver themselves and whatever their predisposition is. So for example, if the caregiver is secure and emotionally has a good sense of self-regulation and nervous system regulation and has sort of a calm, balanced demeanor and personality, then it's very likely that they're going to be able to, even if they mess up the first time and kind of miss something and, you know, think that the baby's hungry when the baby's really tired or think the baby wants to play when the baby really wants to be left alone or whatever, that they repair it well. So even if there's a disconnect, kind of like if you have a fight with your boyfriend or with your partner or whatever it is, it's how you get back together, how you come back and repair whatever the rupture is as opposed to the fact that there was any kind of a conflict or fight in the first place. It's one's security that one brings to the equation that helps one uh, able to have proper boundaries and also see another person's point of view even if you don't agree with it 100% or whatever. But early on 
when we're little babies and we have these caregivers who either do or don't know how to do these things very well, oftentimes because they themselves have been the recipient of ill-attuned caregiving early on and maybe they haven't sort of, you know, untied all the knots of what that is through various healing works, whether it's therapy or, you know, different kinds of therapy, either somatic experiencing therapy or some kind of body work therapy or sometimes talk therapy or meditation or mindfulness or yoga and a variety of different ways that people can uh, integrate and oftentimes have to integrate different modalities in order to sort of get to the tip of the root of what's actually misattuned, um, that that relationship is really critical. So then you have this baby that's either sort of securely attached, if the parent or the caregiver was securely attached, or not securely attached. And if you're not securely attached, which they call insecure attachment, there's a few different sort of flavors of that. One is a person can tend to be avoidant, which is they don't really have a good language for their emotions. They're not really able to talk about what's wrong. They often feel like they have to do everything on their own. They feel like they have to uh, be very directed and focused toward work. And they kind of have a certain amount of disdain for people who have emotional needs that are legitimate and who want to connect and co-regulate and who want to kind of um, be a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, intermingled and commingled because their worldview is I didn't get what I needed I was kind of neglected when I was a kid and now I've learned to kind of be a little bit tighter and so I don't need anybody but yet they try to be in relationships but then kind of break away from relationships and say mm, I don't really need that I'm getting too close to the person I feel vulnerable they're not going to be there for me in the long run this is the story they tell themselves which is not true in the present day necessarily but it's how they learned to survive when they were younger. So that voice, that inner guide, which is kind of not really true necessarily, but viscerally in their bodies feels like it's totally like 100%. Like, hey, this worked when you were a kid. You survived, so don't give up your survival strategy. In present day, it can be really challenging. And so these people ultimately <clears throat> can find difficulty maintaining uh, intimate relationships, whether with partners, lovers, friends, family, whatever. Then you have the other people who are insecurely attached who tend to be what they call ambivalent or anxious, and they have a sort of signal cry that's always going out saying, need me, love me, want me. I'm going to pre-anticipate what you need. I'm going to be hyper vigilant, and I'm going to scan everything all the time to make sure that I know that you know, I'm not going to do anything wrong, so you won't abandon me. So they fear being left alone. You know, they're always looking for other externally focused regulation, whereas the aversive type or the avoidant type that I mentioned earlier that was neglected as a kid uh, fears being in relationship. So it's kind of two opposites, but they're both sort of insecure attachment. And then disorganized or unresolved attachment is sort of what happens when a baby has had really mixed messages, oftentimes with trauma or abuse, where there's um, both sort of avoidant tendencies and ambivalent tendencies that manifest sort of randomly as an adult, meaning that you don't really know which one is going to pop up. <clears throat> now, why do I get into all this business of attachment theory about um, this sort of psychological theory? Because I was talking about the inner critic, and the inner critic tells us that we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, and gosh darn it, you know, people don't like me. That's sort of the opposite of what Stuart Smalley would say, right? Now, Senator out of Minnesota, Al Franken, when he was on Saturday Night Live. And the truth of the matter is, <clears throat> as I've said before, I think I've used this analogy. When we look at the planet Saturn, there's Saturn, which is the core of the planet, the actual planet, and then there's the rings of Saturn, around Saturn. We often mistake the rings of Saturn, which I'll call our conditioning, our learned behavior, which could be, as I was describing, secure or insecure, whether or not we are looking at the world with sort of this trusting, loving, compassionate worldview that's sort of grounded, or whether or not we're in this fearful, sort of negative, kind of caustic, uh, when is the other shoe going to drop uh, kind of worldview, which tends to come from insecure attachment, and it's about 50-50 roughly, about 
percent of the population is secure, the other 50% is, is insecure, that we often mistake that rings of Saturn are conditioning, whether it's through our family, through its society, giving us certain messages like men have to have a six pack and women have to be, have to have big boobs or whatever. We often mistake that for who we really are or who we really need to be, or we adhere to this story of ourselves, which is, well, I'm this way. This is how I am. I always am this way in relationships. I only feel safe when I'm alone, or I only feel safe when I'm with somebody and I can't learn how to be in solitude. It only feels like loneliness, whatever. So this core of the planet of you, not this conditioning, this sort of insecure fear-based activity or worldview <clears throat> that often very much is uh, listening to the inner voice, which is the inner critic that's kind of always saying, you know, like a neurotic Woody Allen tape or whatever, you know, all the little things are Seinfeld, all the little things that are going on, which is funny in a comedy, but in real life, not so much, right? That our true nature is goodness, it's compassion and it's love. So when we sort of are able to witness and step back from separating the conditioned part of us, the inner critic, have compassion for that, recognize that it's learned behavior because of our survival mechanism and instinct from when we were a kid that we're still using today, even though it's kind of vestigial at this point. It served its purpose. Now we can evolutionarily, you know, move beyond it, but that takes effort, meaning there are ways to engage the brain and move sort of our reactive mode of thinking and being from our lower reptilian brain up to our prefrontal cortex, which is more the one that's responsible for responsible for executive functioning and sort of uh, sort of deliberate action and decision making we can we can shift these things once we have awareness of the fact that we actually can operate on two planes right that we're not the core of us is not evil it's not undeserving it's not unworthy it's not you know uh, one of my teachers Joe Lloyd so here in New York likes to say, you know, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, let's go eat worms. I think that was like an old childhood song or something, right, back in the day. We're not that. It's not like that, right? It's actually, we can love ourselves. There's nothing wrong with us. Just because our parents or our caregivers sometimes didn't always know what we were doing, what they were doing, <clears throat> and we learned to survive based on that, doesn't mean that that affects the um, inner titanium, if, of who we really are, but that we're working on this conditioning around it, and that that's the part that's workable. That's the part that we can have compassion for. That's the part that we can kind of uh, sort of say, hey, inner critic voice that keeps arising, that likes to kind of invade my mode of thinking. I hear you. I love that you're like sort of sitting here still trying to put out the fire and make me recognize that you know you think that there's a fire in the house but you know what I was just making a cup of tea and so there was a little bit of steam it's actually not like you know the house is burning down so we don't need to react on a 12 <laughs> to a scale of 1 to 10 that something is really you know a 6 for example right we don't need to to do that but all of that takes practice and those practices definitely, like I said earlier, involve meditation, involve therapy, involve other kinds of modalities. Could be dance therapy, it could be writing, journaling, um, a lot of uh, self awareness and self investigation. But I say this because it requires a certain willingness to not be attached to your own suffering. And that's one of the things that I think a lot of people fall into the rut of because it's easy to do because we think that that is who we are. And when I've asked somebody who is really successful and a super, like, bang up, you know, amazing woman the other day, what if you had the option, if somebody gave you a present, you could open your, your gift, and in it was, you know, total self-love, total self-acceptance, and, you know, um, a real knowledge and awareness that whatever the conditioned behavior was that you had learned, you know, it, it doesn't have to, to sort of lead you by the, by the nose, you know, it doesn't have to carry you away. And she said, quite honestly, she said, I don't know if I could accept it. I don't know if I could accept it. 
So that whole idea of even knowing that there's a way out of it, knowing that like, what if I bought into this idea that actually I'm a good person, that I actually am worthy, that there isn't actually anything wrong with me, and I've learned some habits that are not really as beneficial to me now as they were to helping me to survive when I was a kid that now I have a chance to change because I'm aware of them. And then that takes work, right? You know, you go and you try to watch what you eat, and then, you know, you eat a chocolate bar. But then you know that because it's not really you who you're getting mad at, right? Because you're fine, your inner goodness right here. You're just saying, oh, it's the pull of habit. It's the pull of conditioning, right? I do these things sometimes to self-soothe as a crutch because I need to sort of try to feel better. And maybe that worked for a time when I was a kid, but now it doesn't work so well because I keep gaining weight and I don't want to do that or whatever your thing might be. And now I don't have to do that. I can learn how to sit with myself long enough to recognize that the feelings that arise also pass. Discomfort, anger, anxiety, it'll arise. And if I just sit with it and I don't resist it arising, I'll notice the sensations in my body, notice if my heart or my belly is getting tight or sinking feeling or whatever. Breathe naturally, sit quietly for some moments. And over time, the more we do that, <clears throat> we realize that these sensations kind of arise and pass, up and down, up and down. And joy arises and passes. Anger arises and passes. All things are, you know, transitory for lack of a better word. So I say all of this just to say, don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> don't listen to the inner critic so much. It, but it can be your guide. It can be your teacher, right? That voice is uniquely suited to be your teacher. That voice is the voice that just says, wow, look at all these things that I think are true, right? A belief is, you know, sort of a hardened series of thoughts that we think are true, that we've attached ourselves to, but aren't necessarily true. So how do we know that, you know, they're not necessarily true? We know when we can just look at our conditioned behavior and say, hmm, that's interesting. Habit pattern. I see you. Right. Now I'm an adult. I can actually insert a new kind of outlook on this. And it's not really willpower. It's more like a, a grace or a surrender and the sense of like, yeah, I acknowledge I have conditioned habits. It's going to take some effort to change it. And so you just practice, and that's why all these things are called practices. So um, if you think you might be addicted to suffering, as, even if you don't want to admit it, <laughs> I know I didn't for a while, um, <clears throat> I think the only key to maybe get out of that is to say, wow, there's another option. And basing that option of really owning your own inner goodness. Like, hey, when I came out of the womb, I had no ill intentions. When I see babies today, they are not at fault for much of anything. So, nurture nature, right? So, the nurture part, we can work on. The nature part, maybe not so much, right? We're born with certain genes and stuff like that, and we can change them a little bit through meditation and things um, in our brain, which I'm not going to get into all of that, but um, certain parts of our brain can kind of grow a little bit and other parts that are less useful these days can shrink a little bit and that's terrific. But the main part is is you work with what you've got but only to the degree that you're aware of it and willing to let the suffering go. So I invite you today to consider befriending that inner critic, loving her or him, telling her or him that you know she's amazing, she's taught you so much, she got you here, and you know what? What does she need? Does she need to sit in the corner with a teddy bear? Does she need a cup of tea? Be nice to her. Don't always just say, get the heck out of here. Because in doing that, in making space for her, in allowing her or him to be present, but not taking on the full equivalency that she is all of who you are, that voice, then you can open yourself up to the freedom of no longer having to be addicted to the suffering because then you can open yourself up to joy, full presence, and real kind of day-to-day -day 
just enjoyment of your life, you know, really just uh, noticing all the little things that we get distracted uh, away from and just really just be okay in your own body and comfortable and, you know, kind to yourself and to others in a way that is really there because it's created by a lot more uh, space. So it's a little bit long, 20 minutes. I'm going to sign off. If you um, have any questions or comments, let me know. See you for now. Bye.